Call recording is on. Thank you so much, Reverend McKinstry, and thank you, all of the ministers and, and missionaries and soldiers and servants at the St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. It is a pleasure to be back with you today. We have been, um, I have been absent over the last few days and I was traveling. I'm grateful to be back in town. Now I'm grateful to be back with you. I want to just take another moment to say thank you to each of the ministers of St. Peter who have continued ably uh, in my absence. First of all, Reverend, um, uh, well, I started off last, uh, last week, Reverend, Reverend McClady on last Sunday. Um, Reverend Taylor taught several classes this past week and in Reverend McKinsey. So I want to just say thank you. I've been traveling back and forth with the boys, so everything's good. Just want y'all to know that that's why I've been. So I wasn't just, um, I wasn't loafing around. <laughs> I was doing some doing some work with the, with the boys, and so everything is going well with them. And I'm mighty grateful uh, for your continued prayers for my traveling grace. I, you know, I, I'll take one moment to do a little testimony. Um, <clears throat> my last trip on a plane really was um, when I found out I was sick back in February of of 2017, and um, I was going to my dear friend. And then just the other night, uh, just the other day when I was going to the airport, I had to laugh at Sheffield because I was going through the airport and I was going so fast. I was just walking to see, should have seen me because I was flying down there. Lord, somebody, know what that boy doing with his hands up? But I just had to think about how far God brought me from. God is a mighty good God, and he has brought us all a mighty long way. We can look back over our lives and wonder <clears throat> certain things, but what we can say without a doubt, God has brought us a mighty long way. We can look where we were, we can see where we are. And I'm telling you, if you see where God has brought you from, know he'll keep on taking you the way he wants you to be. So I'm I'm grateful to be back and grateful to see each of you all. Thank you, Reverend Kinsh, again for our opening. Uh, we're going to start a new series tonight in the book of First Thessalonians. If you would join me in the book of First Thessalonians, uh, we're going to study and evaluate this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. Um, Paul, this letter is somewhat different because Paul is giving what I call practical information. And I say that all the time, I use the term practical, but he's giving them kind of, it's not as much doctrine as we learned in, in, in First and Second Timothy. And that's not a problem because um, Paul wrote this letter very, very early. Uh, matter of fact, this is the first letter that Paul wrote. Uh, just as background, if you look at Acts 17 in your time this week, Paul visited the church at Thessalonica um, after he had left the church of Philippi. You remember when he was in Philippi, uh, they locked him up and then he and Silas were released from the uh, Philippian jail um, just through prayer. That was it. They didn't have a great attorney. Uh, they didn't have an appeals process. They simply prayed and they re were released from jail. Uh, later, he went to uh, Thessalonica, particularly the city of Berea. They were there. Uh, and the Bible says they were attacked by some men of the baser sort. That's what the Bible says, the baser sort. They were, they the, the government in Thessalonica was so... Uh, upset with Paul coming to spread the gospel that he assigned um, some some hoodlums to attack Paul and and, and, and Silas and, and, and they did um, but that was only after three weeks of ministry now, I, I'm telling the story for a reason for three consecutive Sundays Paul went to the synagogue and taught about Jesus for three consecutive Sundays people heard the preaching of Paul in the synagogue and came to Christ a church now I want y'all to hear this now a church was born out of three weeks of preaching, each Sunday, somebody would hear about Jesus and somebody would receive Christ as their Savior for three consecutive weeks. That's all Paul was there. But when Paul left town, when they tried to jump on him, he left town with a church in town. Why do I say this? Well, today, um, I want us to be clear that the church does not burst on marketing. A church is not burst on, 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 on a building. A church is not burst in, in, in intellectual thoughts. Churches are built truly on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the churches are built on. Churches are built when sick people and, and spiritual sick people hear about the healing of Jesus and say, I yield, I yield, I can't hold out no longer. Churches are built when people are walking the streets destitute of morals and, and, and integrity, destitute of spiritual um, insights, and they hear about Christ and they come saying, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. But furthermore, churches, Christians, are built on Jesus Christ. We, The more we learn about Christ, the stronger we are. How many can think about to realize the more you know about Christ, the stronger you get. We may grow weaker in our bodies, but when you, when you know the Lord, we go stronger. We go stronger in our spiritual. As Paul said, our inner man in Ephesians. And then later, uh, he says that, 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 the, that the, the, the flesh may be dwindling away, but the inner man gets renewed day by day. So what I'm saying is what we're going to learn here in the book of 1 Thessalonians is how to strengthen us as Christians, how to strengthen our church, um, um, and how to strengthen our, our ability and our, how is it, our expectation 
to share Christ with others. Sometimes we look at evangelism as something far-fetched, but Paul showed what could be done with just evangelism. Paul didn't have a Paul didn't have a pulpit, he didn't have a market, he didn't have microphones, he didn't have praise things. All he did was share Christ. And guess what happened? People came to be saved. And so Paul had experience in this church at Thessalonica. He left him after three weeks and he went uh, to Berea and later he went to Athens and he was in a very difficult spot. And I want us to hear this. So Paul was very emotional because he had had such a rough go. When you're in ministry, sometimes it's going to be a challenge. And I want somebody to understand that. When you're really doing the work of the Lord, you're going to face challenges. Why? Because the enemy's going to throw everything at you. I said this to my oldest son the other day. When you're doing the work that God's called you to do, expect challenges. And I say the same thing to St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church family and friends. When you're doing the work of the Lord, I want you to understand that challenges are going to come. Why? Because the enemy wants to stop us from doing the work of the Lord. The enemy can't stop God, so the enemy attacks us. And so Paul had been attacked um, physically and had been attacked uh, spiritually. Even when he was in Athens, people did not receive the message. And you can imagine that Paul was somewhat upset. Um, and so he was in Corinth, and he wrote this letter um, to the church at Thessalonica. But this is what made it right, y'all. Um, he sent Timothy. And Silas, he said, I want y'all to go out and see what's going on in, in, in Thessalonica. And when they came back, they said, Paul, guess what? He said, what? They said, everything is going good. That They love the Lord. They're serving the Lord. They're faithful to the Lord. Everything is going good, Paul. And, and so Paul got so excited about it that what he did was that he wrote this letter. He sat down. I can imagine him. If somebody called me and I was out of town and said, St. Peter's doing great. Matter of fact, I got that report this weekend. I should have wrote y'all a letter. Um, St. Peter's doing great. Preaching is going forth. Teaching is going forth. People are still worshiping and praising the Lord. Uh, I would just sit down and write a, 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 little, a, little, a little note to say, God bless you and thank you for your faithfulness in God. And that's why Paul wrote this letter to the church of Thessalonica, because of their faithfulness to God, uh, even in his absence. But most of all, because of their faithfulness to God. So let's think, keep that in mind as we go through this letter uh, that Paul wrote. It was, again, his first letter. He wrote it about A.D. 50. Uh, and, and it was... Uh, uh, it was a letter, again, to, to, to encourage. That's what it was. Um, they were facing persecution, um, not so much the false teaching, but just the persecution of being Christians. And so Paul wrote to encourage them um, and really to inspire them because they grew despite the persecution. Um, their testimony mm -hmm. of their faith in God despite the persecution mm -hmm. was what Paul was writing to kind of stir up more of that. He wanted to comfort them. He wanted to motivate them. Um, and, and continue to share with them the reality of the Lord's return. That's, that's the three things he wanted to do, comfort, motivation, and he wanted to comfort them, let them know that Jesus is in fact and was in fact coming back. So let's, let's, let's delve right in here. Chapter 1 of First Thessalonians, verse 1. Paul starts by saying this, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. So Paul, and I always like the fact that Paul, almost in every one of his letters, included what I call his teammates. Although Paul was a great preacher, Although Paul was a great writer, although Paul was a great missionary, although Paul was a great apostle, Paul always established and notified, identified. He always uh, recognized all those who were in ministry with him. And that's what makes, makes ministry. Um, a few weeks ago when I left Pastor Harris, you know, I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Despite all the people that were there, I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I said, I'm very excited for you. I said, because now you get to work with a ministry team. I said, I've been blessed in St. Peter to not have to do much on my own. I got a team. We've always had a team. We always had, ever since I've been there 18 years now, I've always had a team, a team of people. Um, the ushers, they serving. The deacons, they serving. The mothers, they testifying to serving. The, um, the trustees are faithful. A team, it, it's what it takes. I would not have been a pastor of St. Peter 18 years, and we wouldn't have been where we are was it not for the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of God's people to God in doing the ministry of the Lord. Okay? We're clear about that. Not one time I ever wake up on Sunday morning and call and say, uh, we're going to have ushers day, we're going to have uh, praise day, we're going to have deacons that day. It just happens. And so, Paul, I told Harris that I was glad to see that he had a team of people. And just like that, I read this today and remind, reminded myself why I said that. Paul acknowledged those who worked with him, who? Sylvanus or Silas uh, and Timothy. They, they were his <clears throat> compatriots. When they, I can imagine them going from city to city. Um, and I can picture them getting to come and get to a, find in a hotel room or wherever they can lay their heads. And they didn't just go to bed at night. They talked about more of the word, what they were going to share the next day. And so Paul acknowledged them because they, he knew that the church at Thessalonica were aware of Silas. They were aware of Timothy. And he wanted them to know that not only was he concerned about them and not only was he happy for them, but his teammates were happy for him as well. You might ask, well, why did Pastor Thomas say that? I want us to know is in the church, we work as a team. 
If you are part of a ministry in a ministry, like if you're part of a ministry at St. Peter, that's a team. They ain't your, they ain't your squad. That's a team. Y'all work together. St. Peter, we work best as a team. That means we have to love God, love each other, and understand that I ain't got to do all things by myself. I can just connect. If you are ministry, you say, well, I don't need nobody else. That's not ministry. This is you. But if you are a child of God and you understand that there's some uniqueness in working together for the, on the banner of Christ, that's a team. And that's what Paul demonstrates in every one of his letters that he wrote uh, to the new church. He said, Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy, he said, we're writing unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father. I love that. He said, that they're, they're, they're in. And he used that, um, um, that's, that's not a, that's a conjunction. He, he connected them. He said, what makes this church great is they're in God the Father. They're, they're, their relationship is not ancillary. They're not just saying God is and we're separate. It said that they were, their love for God put them in the, in God the Father, in a unique relationship with God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what motivated them wasn't numbers. What motivated them wasn't uh, popularity. What motivated them was the fact they were doing what they did because they loved God, they loved Jesus Christ, and they wanted other people to know about him as well. So that's why Paul said that in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. He moves on. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what I, I think I may have said this before in some sermon in the past. This is what I identified. This is a church that Paul loved. If you look at the church of Corinth, Paul didn't have that same kind of love for them. He called them, you know, the people in, in Corinth. But he says, I want you to have grace. And in this word, this particular derivation or, or definition of grace, he's talking about gladness, happiness. He says, I want you to have joy, happiness. Um, and, and, and peace. Um, and, I, this, and it comes from God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. He, taught, he teaches a lesson here. He says, understand that gladness doesn't come from your circumstance. Gladness comes from your relationship with God and Christ. I've talked to people sometimes. They say, I wish I could be happy. You know where happiness comes from? You can have all the money in the world and be sad. You can have the biggest house in Atlanta and be sad. What gives you joy is your relationship with God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ, because you can be homeless and have joy. You can be sick, believe me, and have joy. You can go through trials and tribulations and have joy as you are in Christ Jesus, and it comes from. So when you're in Christ Jesus, if you when you're in God and in Christ Jesus, that means your joy is derived from God in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul is teaching them and teaching us today uh, from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. He said, verse one. Now, this is where you know again that Paul loves his church. He loves not, he doesn't love them because of you know, their background. This is his first letter to the European churches. He loved them for their commitment to the Lord. He said, verse two, he said, we give thanks to God always for you all. One of the letter Paul used this combination of words. He said, Paul said, I'm always praying to God. I'm always praying unto God, giving thanks for you all. He said, I'm always praying for you. Why, Paul? He said, because I remember verse three, I remember without ceasing your work of faith. Paul said, when I was there, you were faithful. In other words, picture this, picture this. Paul goes to Thessalonica, all right? He preaches the gospel. People come to Christ. But you know what happened the next week? The people that got saved that first week went and brought some other people. That's faith, okay? But you know that third week? The people that got saved the first two weeks, not just the second week, but the first two weeks went and told somebody else about Christ, and they brought them. People didn't get saved that first week and just go home saved. They continued in the work. And that's why Paul says, I praise God and thank God for you. And I pray for you because I remember your, without ceasing, your work of faith. That's work of faith and labor of love. A labor of love is something you do because not because somebody told you to do it. You do it because you want to do it. Uh, because you can't help but to do it. And that's what Paul saw in Thessalonica for those three weeks. And then when he got the report, he said, I see it still going on. I see people are still coming to Christ. I still see people growing. I still see Bible study being uh, participated in. I still see uh, the joy. I can hear, I heard the testimonies of the joy you have. Paul said, I'm thanking God for you and I'm praying, praising God for you because of your faith, your labor of love, and this last one, and patience of hope. Despite the fact, and I said this earlier, despite the fact that they were under intense scrutiny, despite the fact that they were under intense persecution, Paul says, I, I, I see your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I want you to watch this. They weren't looking at their circumstance. They were looking to God to deliver them from their circumstance. I had a, a, a conversation with a friend the other day who was going through a difficult time. I said, listen, you, you can focus on what's happening and you'll be sad, but you can focus on the fact that God's got in control and you'll be happy. And that is my prayer for her. And that's our prayer for each other, that we focus not on ourselves and not on our situation, but instead we focus on God. 
he says, remember, I want, I'm going to go to this again. Remember your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. That's three things. Miss Simpson, if you're on here, Sister Thomas, why don't you write those three things down for me? Because that's what makes a strong church. Lord, just show me that. What makes a strong church is a work of faith, a labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. I want that written down because that's, we can talk about that all day. If you if we measure ourselves by our works of faith, uh, by our labors of love, and by our patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, if we measure ourselves by that, that'll make us strong Christians. If we measure our church by that, that'll make us a strong church. Church shouldn't be measured by any other thing than, but those three things. That's why Paul loved the church that's like because they had these three things. They were faithful in their work, they were they labored because of love, and they had patience of hope. They didn't see what they saw. They saw what God promised. And so Paul says, I love you and I pray for you all the time. And I praise God for you because of those three things. Um, and this is what the basis of it is, verse four. And I might stop here tonight because I, when I get to verse five, I'm going to take off. Verse four, he says this. <clears throat> I'm grateful. I'm praying for you. I'm praising God for you because I'm remembering your ceasing work without ceasing your work of faith. I'm, I'm because of your labor, love, and, patience, and because of your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. But this we say in verse four, knowing, beloved, brother and beloved, your election of God. He says, I'm excited about it because I know you're elected to God. He said, but then the reason you're doing it is because you know you're elected of God. This is another time we see the word elected. That means selected, chosen by God. Um, today, for those Falcon fans, I don't know if Deacon Lyons on here, but he's got one. Yeah, he's on here. The Falcons traded their quarterback. They got a third-round draft pick. I mean, that wasn't much, but, you know, it is what it is. But they got a third-round draft pick. But they get to pick somebody um, um, for or, or select somebody in exchange for Matt Ryan. But here's what I want us to understand. As Christians, if you can see yourself in your screen or in the mirror, wherever you are, you are elected by God, selected by God. But you weren't a third-rounder. You were a first-rounder. You were God's number one pick. When he decided who he was going to pick, he chose you to be his, our number one pick. And that goes for all of us. And so in understanding that, Paul said that ought to be your motivation, knowing that you were elected of God. What does that mean? If we're elected of God, if we realize that God chose us, then our work ought to be of faith. If we know when we're elected of God, our labor ought to be a labor of love. If we understand that we're elected by God, we ought to have patience of hope that we're waiting, yet watching. We're waiting, yet expecting because we realize that we are elected of God, because we belong to God. I think I told y'all this story a while ago. I'm gonna tell it one more time to make connect the dots on this one. Okay, when I was um, ninth grade, I didn't have a driver's license, but I was in high school and I would have to practice sometimes. Sometimes I just wanna hang around at school. And I remember one day I, I um, was waiting on my dad to come and, and everybody just left with just me and the janitor. And I never got upset um, because I, I knew dad was coming. It didn't, didn't bother me. I was just sitting there messing around. And he showed up and he said, I'm so sorry. He said, you know, I had something happen to the store. He ran me later. I apologize. I said, no problem. He said, you're not upset? I said, no, I knew you were coming. Why? Because I was his, his son. I knew, I, I, where was he going to go? He had to come get me. Not because he had to, but because he loved me. When you know that God loves you, you know that he's going to deliver you. He's going to take care of you. As Paul said in the book of 2 Timothy, he's going to deliver us from the jaws of the lion. And so that means that our, our, our response to knowing that God has got our back because we're elected by God, our response to knowing how much God cares for us, our response to knowing that God has chosen us is to be to, to, to work by our faith, to labor in love, and to be patient, knowing that what He has promised will come to pass. We never had to sit and wonder, is God going to come? Why? He, he, he may not come when you want him, but He's always what? He's always right on time. And that is the song, but that's the truth. Because God elected us. He wouldn't elect us to leave us or forsake us. He elected us so he can deliver us in due season and in due time to our ultimate um, our ultimate salvation. But also in the times that we live in. He always deliver us, delivers us out of our challenges. Why? Because we are his elect. And I want somebody to say that before we got the phone tonight. I'm God's elect. I am God's elect. That's who I am. And because of that, I'm going to work of faith. I'm going to do what I do by faith in God. I'm going to do what I do because I love God and I'm going to have patience of hope in God through Jesus Christ because I'm elected of him. I'm going to stop tonight a little early at 724, but I want us to keep keep these things in mind in these first four verses as Paul opens another and opens the door to his church at Thessalonica and as he speaks to us in 2022. 
We uh, have to be a team. We ought to always understand um, that gladness and joy does not come from material things. It comes from my relationship with God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should understand as a result of our election by God that we should always work by faith, labor in love, and have patience and hope. I'm going to stop there tonight. I pray, praise God for you. I thank God for each of you. I do. Uh, and, and just your faithfulness to God and faithfulness to this Bible study. Even when I'm not on the line or even when I'm not able to participate, I still get the number of people on. And each time it warms my heart that there's no fall off. There's no drop off. And you know what it is? That ain't because Pastor Thomas is a pastor. That's because you love the Lord. And that's what I love. Let's pray tonight. Father God, in Jesus' name, we love you. We thank you. And we do praise you for all the things that you have done and that you are doing. We thank you, Lord, tonight for, uh, again, another opportunity to live in expectation by reading your word. We thank you, Lord, that our expectation, we learned another key element of our expectation. It should be based upon the fact that we are your elect. I pray, God, that you bless uh, every household and every family and every individual believer that's on this line tonight. I do pray again, Lord, that you will let this word get in our hands and feet, that we may be more equipped to serve you as a team and as, in, as, as Christians. I pray, God, that your word will get in our hearts, that we may be again strengthened in our inner man. I pray, God, that your word will get in our ears, that we can hear your word over all the winds of the world. I pray, God, that your word will get on our minds and in our minds. We may have peace. So pass it all understanding. And the fire and dark to say will be quenched. Let your word, Lord, get on our on our lips, Tom, vocal and long, that we may uh, declare your word to a dying world, teach other and to ourselves. And I pray again as we close out tonight, Lord, that you just let us rest assured in you. That you give the hand protection around us again, Lord, to protect us from the fire and dark to say that you will speak to our hearts each night that we may not worry, but rest the rest of the righteous. We love you, we thank you, and we do praise you, oh God. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless the St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. Hold on, Zoom.